Hello and welcome to episode 72 of Foreign Correspondence, a podcast that brings you interviews with journalists around the world. I'm Jake Spring, a foreign correspondent with 11 years experience in Brazil and China. I've been wanting to talk to Valerie Hopkins, now a Moscow correspondent for the New York Times, for a while now. Kit Gillett, who was featured way, way back in episode 15 of Foreign Correspondence talking about his career in Romania and China, suggested I speak to her about the Balkans way back in October 2021. I was like, ooh, the Balkans. I've never spoken to any journalists who have covered that. And that'll make a great episode. Then I looked her up and saw she had just moved to Moscow for the New York Times. I thought, oh man, I just had somebody who was covering Russia on the show. But if she's there now and I have to put Moscow in the title and not the Balkans, it won't appear that different to the listeners. Anyway, I thought, okay, we can still make the episode about the Balkans. Who cares about the title? Of course, scheduling a recording session between two busy journalists takes a while, and a lot has changed since October 2021. No one really saw it coming that Russia would invade Ukraine. And now Valerie has reported from both Russia and Ukraine since the war broke out, so we have lots to talk about besides the Balkans. And maybe it's more interesting to more people. But not to worry, we still give the Balkans some love in this episode and talk about her many years reporting there. The recent stories that stick with me the most from Valerie are those that report in Russia about Russian views on the war. Indeed, for the longest time, it was never even really acknowledged there was a war. How do normal Russians justify it to themselves? How do the parents of killed Russian soldiers justify it? Not easy conversations to have, and Valerie has covered a few different stories on this denial or rationalization or whatever you want to call it. That gives you some idea of what's in store. So now, here's my conversation with Valerie Hopkins, Moscow correspondent with the New York Times. To warm up a little bit, if you could tell us about your surroundings, both uh, the physical space around you and geographically where you are, and then also a little bit about what uh, your past week of work has been like. I'm actually currently in Berlin. When the New York Times stopped its work in Russia in March of last year, the beginning of March. I was in Ukraine, but all of the rest of my colleagues left Russia because of draconian new censorship laws. And eventually we settled over the summer on the fact that our sort of bureau in exile, Moscow bureau in exile, would be in Berlin. Since then, I do go and work in Russia, but I'm the only journalist there right now for the New York Times and in big, lonely, empty bureau. So it's really nice to be in the Berlin Bureau also sometimes, which is full of colleagues covering both Russia and Germany. It's a rare moment of sun here in Berlin, in wintry January Berlin. And um, I'm sitting in my colleague Melissa Eddy's office. She's on book leave and I'm looking at her family photos. <laughs> the past week of work, my work now is a bit, it feels bifurcated because I'm really in awe of how well my colleagues who are all outside of Russia have been able to cover the country, uh, talking to sources and reporting remarkably about how the society is changing or how, you know, getting incredible access to people who are criticizing the war or losing their relatives in the war. For me, it feels a little bit weird to do that from here because I can also and do also do that while I'm in Russia. So for the past week, mostly I've been trying to organize visas and accreditation for different trips that I'm taking, get some of my plans for the year in order in terms of, you know, what are the big ideas and projects I want to focus on and also working on on one culture piece um, that hasn't been published yet. So I don't want to say too much about it. Sure. That's a lot. How long of a flight is it from Berlin to Moscow? Well, I think it used to be something like four or five hours. It, now it takes the whole day to travel there. Oof. There's not a ton of options. You can fly. I, I always go through Istanbul. I, know, I feel like I know every nook and cranny of the new Istanbul airport. Although I felt like that, and only recently did I discover that there is a spa on the second floor <laughs> where you can get a massage. Mm -hmm. um, but sorry, real talk. Yeah, now it takes... <laughs> The better part of the whole day, right? Like you can wake up at 7 a.m. to get a flight in Berlin and not arrive in Moscow until 2 or 3 in the morning. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That's tough. Well, that gives us some sense of what things are like for you now. I mean, we'll get back to it in a bit. 
but uh, now it's time to turn back the clock and people usually want to know how you got to where you are today. And I like to start way back at the beginning. So if you could tell us where you were born, a little bit about what growing up was like, and if anything made you interested in journalism early on. Sure. This one's really easy, actually. Uh, Well, I was born in Washington, D.C. at Sibley Hospital and grew up in D.C. um, in a neighborhood that is now known as Brightwood that I think didn't have a name when I was living there. Um, (laughs) Long before the developers and property managers descended on the neighborhood. I sort of grew up in the newsroom, in the studio even. My mom was a broadcaster with the Voice of America in the Russian service. Oh, wow. And I grew up only with my mom, you know, only child, single parent, and I spent a lot of time at the Voice of America on Independence Avenue in Washington, D.C. And I, it was a really cool place. I feel really lucky now as an adult, like looking back, I was a very well-mannered and well-behaved kid, but I was still a kid (laughs) constantly in the workplace. And like, you don't see that very often, you know, and either I was sitting quietly in the studio or occasionally, you know, telling people like Mike one, Mike two or whatever, or like, I don't know, building cardboard box castles or something in the hallway. But, (laughs) but what was really lucky for me was that I got to spend time in a lot of different language services. So, you know, of course, when I was a kid, my mom worked in the Russian service, but eventually she took on a a job that put her in touch kind of with all the services, right? So sometimes I would be hanging out in the Kurdish service. I remember asking the guys, like, why can't I find your country on the map? (laughs) (laughs) Or I also spent a lot of time in the Turkish service. My mom is half Turkish, so she had a lot of close friends who were working in there really special people who who shaped my life um and then also on the second floor are all the different language studios and I don't know if you've ever been to Voice of America I think a lot of Americans actually don't really know what it is but you can there's an I couldn't even tell you how many studios there are but they all have really big windows and when they're on air you can go and like press the button and you can hear them you know so my mom would be like okay, I'm Harik. This is the language that Jesus spoke, and this is the, one of the languages in Ethiopia now, you know, or you know, Mandarin service, Cantonese service, Hausa. And that was really cool. Like, as someone who didn't, you know, before I went to college, I only was able to go abroad one time in my life when I was 9, 10, and my mom was sick, so I spent the summer in Germany, which was very cool. But otherwise, like, this was my real exposure to the wider world, and it made me very hungry to see it and experience it. And yeah, I think it was also the time that I was growing up, right? Like, so I spent a lot of time with people from the Russian service and the other post-Soviet countries at a time when I was born in 1987. So some of my first memories are of this early Glasnost and Perestroika era. Like I remember spending I don't know, 48 hours straight in the office when when Andrei Sakharov died. But I also think that, I don't know that I remember anything super concrete, but I think a lot of these people themselves, most of whom were emigrants, felt tremendous pride in their work. In I think a lot of them felt that they had made a real contribution to, you know, the collapse of communism, to the Berlin Wall coming down, and to, you know, feeling this excitement about the roots of democracy being planted. And I think that that sense of purpose, coupled with this real hunger to see the world, I didn't really ever consider any other profession, probably. I think I also wasn't really aware that in this day and age, no matter what you do, if you're good at it and would like to work abroad, you can. You know, I just thought, like, this is the only way, like that or or (laughs) diplomacy and... I eventually tried that and realized it wasn't so much... I tried that. I had an internship at the State Department and realized that I would probably still prefer journalism. But I think that's... Also, there was, like... There was a lot of encouragement on this side, right? So, like, I'd be reading a book or doing my homework, and my mom would call me in and say, like, what are you doing? Like, why are you doing your homework? Like, history's happening now. Like, come and watch (laughs) the news. So uh, that was very central in our household. I think we always subscribed to four newspapers and would read them in the car on the way to school and watch the news 60 Minutes every night and Barbara Walters. 
so I was going to ask, uh, so did you pick up any languages as a kid um, growing up in this environment? I did, actually. My mom, she always had big plans for me. Um, <laughs> like, oh, my God, I need to stop talking. Like, we need to delete this. I don't want to talk about my mom so much. But I, she did um, talk to me in... So my mom's half Russian and half Turkish. She actually never lived in Russia, but she spent her whole life somehow, like, covering the country from exile, like, since she was 19, basically. So she she had tried, I think, at one point to get me, like, a nanny that spoke to me in Turkish, and she spoke to me in Russian. The Turkish, not no Turkish stuck. And the Russian, I don't remember it, but, you know, according to her, I spoke absolutely perfect Russian, <laughs> you know. And when we... When we would go to the doctor's office, she was, or when I was sick, she was always telling me, you know, uh, fairy tales or bedtime stories in Russian. I also went to, like, Saturday school where we would do the plays and stuff. And even for a time, I had, you know, a teacher after school who taught me how to read and write, along with another girl named Asya. But at a certain point, and I really don't remember it or understand it, but at a certain point, like many children of immigrants, I was just, um, I stopped being interested. I stopped responding in Russian. Yeah. And I, I didn't like, I didn't value it. And I just wish I could go back and shake some sense into my nine year old self. The only way I justify it to myself is my mom had cancer, which thankfully has never come back when I was nine. And so I went oh, wow. for the summer to, to live in Germany with some neighbors who had moved there and I don't know, like, maybe I just stopped, and when I came back... Or, you know, you, you start to realize, like, other people don't speak foreign languages at home, or, like, no one else... I don't... I really don't know, and I'm so sad, because it's like I could have, you know, had that and learned a different foreign language, and then just been a real reporting powerhouse or something. But after that, like, that lasted only for a few years, because when I went to college, I took Russian and was committed to trying to get back this gift uh, and also to sort of understand that piece of my identity just to explain like my mom was born in China oh wow the the daughter of uh, my re- grandmother who had fled around the rev- time of revolution to Manchuria and a Turkish merchant from Azerbaijan I don't know so so she also like it's not that we have this like strong connection to Russia itself or the Soviet Union or like the country, but the literature, um, the poetry, the music was there. You know, we didn't have friends or family who were who were there or we weren't in touch with with anyone there. And I don't even know how much my mom sort of knew tangibly about softer culture besides like dissident publications and newspapers, which was something that she studied. So it was also that there wasn't that closer, intimate connection. I think also, you know, my mom, as someone who um, first had to immigrate as a child from China to Turkey and then from Turkey to America and age 78 is still getting asked, where are you from, despite living (laughs) um, 60 plus years in America, I think she was like, okay, like, you know what? You just be American. You're going to have a better life, a different life than the one I had. And of course, I'm like trying now to go back and understand all of these intangible things about what makes me who I am and all that stuff. So you went to college and you studied Russian and sometime as a teenager, you had a change of heart and basically wanted to interrogate your identity. And I guess, where did you decide to go to school and and what exactly did you major in? Well, I think I already, by the time I was 15, I was like, mom, like she was so strict and so bossy. And like, why couldn't you have been strict and bossy about this particular thing, this one thing, you know? (laughs) But yes, I decided to go to William and Mary. I I didn't really know, right? I, I, you know, I didn't go on any college tours or my mom didn't graduate from college. And at that time we were already living in Virginia and... I kind of thought, like, I'm from Washington, D.C. Like, do I want to live in, like, Deep Village, Colonial Williamsburg? Like, not really. (laughs) But I actually am very glad that I went there. I had a fantastic time, and I feel that there's kind of nothing that replaces, actually, the college experience that's in a college town. You know, a really small... We had, like, at that time, 55 or 5,700 undergrad students. So it wasn't overwhelming where you can get lost. I just don't know how students on campuses of, like, 40,000 people make it. I don't know. For me, it was really valuable to 
be in the commons or the center of the of the campus and you know bump into people but always meet someone new as well you didn't run out of people and I studied international relations actually with a with a focus on, on Russian and post-service studies so everyone has to do a language and I did that one and it was a great experience I mean uh, William and Mary because it's a, it's actually a state school um, oh really? So it was yes, which was great. Like I was able to graduate without debt, which is a big I, I credit as a big factor for why I was able to sort of go and work in the Balkans uh, and freelance for a long time without the stress of uh, having to pay off massive student loans. I, I was in the student government. I was a student body vice president and then president, and I was really at that time actually quite interested in. I was always interested in journalism, but I knew how hard it is to make it work. And I was also just really interested in how the political forces were, were shaping so much of our lives, I guess, then and, and I presumably still now. You go off and intern at the State Department, I imagine, around this time. Um, and is that what makes you decide you want to, journalism is what you really want to do or what happens? No, I mean, well, I think after my sophomore year, I don't know how, I don't know how this happened, but I was very lucky. I got an internship at the embassy in Moscow, and I was working at that time in the office of Bill Burns, who's now the CIA director, and it was amazing. Not that I was, like, shadowing him on a daily basis, but it was very cool just to see how the system functioned, and I sort of had in the back of my mind that as someone who wanted to be a foreign correspondent and cover international affairs, it would actually be useful to understand how the system functioned from the inside. And obviously, you know, as a college student, you're not getting a top secret maximum security clearance, but I still did learn a lot about, you know, what are ambassadors really doing? How do they communicate? How does policy get shaped? And now I'm also very glad that I did that to see just the change, you know, Moscow in 2007 is a much different place than I found it in 2021 when I started this job. Already at that time, you know, I met a number of diplomats that I really respected and especially the ambassador, the deputy ambassador. But I also felt that there were already at that time that you're encouraged to be very careful about who you meet and many people live on the compound. I don't want to, I don't want to offend anyone. I have tremendous respect, especially now people are working in very difficult conditions, but I think I just wanted a little bit more freedom and also to genuinely, to engage on the country in a different way without always being followed around or always having an agenda for every trip or something. Now, of course, I'm still being followed around everywhere. So it's not like (laughs) that, but sure. I think I just, yeah, I wanted to do something a bit different. And the following summer, actually, I was able to be part of a trip that William & Mary had been running since 99 to volunteer in Bosnia. So we were working in one of Bosnia's larger cities called Zenica, and it's a massive steel plant there. So it's not known for its dazzling air quality or views, but as someone with this sort of like Russian, Turkish background, Balkans, Bosnia, I was really drawn to Bosnia and I felt very welcomed. I don't know if you've ever been there, but there's an incredible sense of hospitality and welcome. And as someone who had a decent command of Russian, I found it, the languages are are not that similar, but they are both Slavic and I could pick up the language quite quickly. And by the end of my first month there, I felt like I could have like pretty good basic conversations. I had a lot of patient friends and teachers. You know, we lived with a host family. The teaching I did, I don't think I took to. It's really, I got a new respect for people who can stand in front of a classroom and command children's attention for 40 minutes at a time. But the rest of the trip, I really loved. However, there was a lot of difficulties that we had with a partner that we had at that time. This was 2008. And I think a lot of international donors were pulling back their engagement in the region, let's say. The NGO that we had worked with had done incredible work helping kids who had experienced wartime trauma, but this is something that they, with time, had already had been changing a bit. And I guess, you know, they weren't able to adapt to the new 
fundraising needs. And so I got a grant to go back after my senior year, which was great because I did not know what I was going to do when I graduated. <laughs> and I was able to help set up a new program for students in Sarajevo that's still running today. And oh, great. then I got a very lucky break. Actually, another woman who was on a Fulbright who had also participated in this program, her boyfriend at the time was working at the o OSCE, and he said, like, oh, you'd be great, you know, in the press office. There's so many applications, nobody wants to look at them. Like, you know, just come in for a meeting, and, you know, they told me, come back in February, you have the internship, which at that time was paid. I wasn't sure what to do, but I had... In D.C., I guess we had drinks at the National Press Club with Max Fisher, who I don't know if you are familiar with. He's an opinion call. He writes the interpreter column now for the New York Times and just wrote a book, actually, about social media. And he had already, like, just a few years out of college, just was rising in the ranks. I think he was at The Atlantic then, and he was one of the first people to go to Vox. Anyways, I don't need to talk about Max, but he told me, like, if you want to be a journalist, a foreign correspondent, just go somewhere. And I was kind of like, well, Bosnia, is this the right place? Or where else am I going to go? That This was 2000, 2010. And I don't know, whatever. I just, I, I really liked Bosnia. And I think that's really important is to find a place that you really like. I felt very grateful. I ended up working for the OSC for a year. And that gave me a very strong grounding in the incredibly complicated political system that that is Bosnia and Herzegovina, you know, with uh, three presidents and 13 ministries of education and, <laughs> and health, and I'm not even going to go into all the complications here. And then, actually, I think, you know, I liked that work, and I was thinking of continuing, but there was no more funding for my position, and I had also, like, broken my ankle skiing on the Olympic Mountains, and <laughs> wow. it was a, I was sort of thinking, what am I going to do now? This is terrible. And I had a visit at that time from a friend of mine who was living in Istanbul, editing the Houdiette Daily News in English, which I believe no longer exists, like many news, good newspapers. And he just said, like, why don't you start freelancing for us? I thought, okay. So I remember my first story. <laughs> there was a very beloved Bosnian army general who's actually a Serb who was arrested, Jovan Divjak, who recently died. He was arrested, I think, taking an international flight. They were starting to use these Interpol arrests. Um, I was an, uh, there had been another... Bosnian army person who was also arrested and held for some time before being detained. And there was a massive protest in, to support him. And this editor said, like, I'll, t I'll take that. And so I went out in the streets on my crutches, tried to talk to people. And I, as, I mean, okay, I'm terribly chatty now, but I can be incredibly shy. I still, like, despise Vox Pops and I uh, get yeah. into my head and I think too hard about who am I going to approach. And was, anyways, in the end, I did the story... I did a couple of articles for them, and eventually I got another internship with the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, which is a really sprawling organization, but the one in Bosnia at that time was really focused on reporting war crimes trials at the court in Bosnia, which all of the big high-profile, or the 161 most high-profile and important cases were being handled in The Hague at the ICTY, but... The Bosnian courts were handling thousands of smaller but no less important cases, including genocide. And Bjorn had, I don't know, 10, 12 reporters at that time sitting in almost every war crimes proceeding in court. And there had been international judges and prosecutors working in Bosnia as well at that time. So some of the proceedings were being translated into English. And yeah, I was like a trial reporter. I remember thinking at one time, like, okay, like the old model of like going to a super local paper and being a court reporter, like, okay, I'm just doing that just in a different language, in a different context with like yeah. more extreme crimes. And it was really great to sort of understand how, I don't know, how post-conflict justice works and, and what it meant to people. And also to, you know, when I had gone there the first time or as a student, you're filtering out, you don't understand what people in the radio were talking about, or you don't realize that at that time, and I would say still now, like, this is still a, a big part of people's lives on a daily basis. Like, you hear about it on the radio every day. When it's a bigger case, you know, at the shopping mall, they would, like, show it on the screen, someone getting sentenced, wow. stuff like that. Yeah. And shortly thereafter, I met the founder of the Organized Crime and Corruption Reporting Project, which was based in Sarajevo. 
and grew out of, you know, a big initiative to support local media in the Balkans and centers for investigative reporting. And I was lucky enough to get hired by them, you know, to produce daily web content. I think that they, at that time, were working a lot with partners to do really long, deep investigations, but already at that time, and I think now they have succeeded to a tremendous extent to try to become just a hub of news about organized crime and corruption news from all over the world, you know, the Panama Papers and, and all this type of stuff. So I also was exposed to that. But at a certain time, I think, I don't know, my cousin was living in New York and I was sort of thinking, oh my God, I, I, could, I could live in Bosnia forever. I love it here. I'm really happy. But like, what am I going to make my career? How am I going to do this? Like, will I just like get married here and stay forever? And of course I'm like, 25 or 26 <laughs> but you know that already it already felt like three years out of college seems it's like the biggest part of your life right so I applied to grad school and actually my boss at the time was like hmm, young people never stay anywhere long enough to really learn something and grad school what are you gonna do there and he was he was kind of like curmudgeon but mostly in a good way <laughs> so I, I went to Columbia's Masters of Arts program in political journalism. I'm sure I think you've had plenty of people on the show who talk, there's like this distinction between the two. Yeah, so. They haven't talked about the distinction. Usually I ask like, oh, what, what did you do there? And they like really gloss over the differences in the programs. I really don't actually know Well, the for the three listeners that want to know, and you, there's a Master of Science, which is the main program. Um, and that is like, I think people who have one or two years of experience or none go in there and it's really like the nuts and bolts. Your group operates like a newsroom, you know, you get some neighborhood of New York and you're producing stories and your teacher's editing them. And I think that they make you work across all media. And I think I would have benefited eminently from that one. But the Master of Arts program is more subject matter focused. So you have politics, business, um, science and environment, technology, and arts and culture. I was in the politics group and there's about 15, 20 people in each section. And actually you have to take half of your classes outside of the J school. So I took like law and politics of conflict management and prevention, like gender and displacement. And I think I also took a class on gulag literature, which was really cool. <laughs> and it's also geared towards long form. So we, we didn't actually write a lot. You know, I think each semester in our main seminar, we had three sort of longer pieces to like 2,000 words. And then the big project was the 10,000 word master's thesis that you work like all year on. And I wrote mine about female war criminals from Bosnia because at that time there was only one woman ever charged or sentenced with a war crime, uh, Biljana Plavšić at the ICTY, who was in a more political role. But there were many women who participated on all sides and there was a few that were just starting to be, that, whose crimes were just starting to be recognized. And I was able to interview one of them while her case was on trial. I think she was hoping. Oh, wow. Um, you know, that was why she talked to me. Yeah, because afterwards, when I tried to follow up, I wasn't so lucky. But yeah, so, and that was really interesting. And I was very glad that they encouraged that. And I'll preempt your embarrassing question. I think the most embarrassing thing I can think of is that at graduation when they like called my name <laughs> to, like I think that one of my classmates got best thesis and I, there was like two runners up. And I did not believe that they called my name. I just sat in my seat. I was like, I must have heard it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so I never went up to like, but anyway, I was, I was really, funny. anyways, yeah. I guess I still didn't have the confidence in my own reporting or writing or whatever to think. Because there were so many amazing ones, you know? And you're always talking. It was like everyone's obsession for the year. How's it going? And I was always like, oh, my God, I just don't know. You know, you go through that process and nine-tenths of the way till the end or maybe a bit before, you just think, like, does anyone care? Why am I doing this? Did I pick the right thing? You know, the agony that comes um, late in the game. Did it, uh, did it get published anywhere out of curiosity? I mean, you I'll get... preempt your regret question as well. Like I tried. So right after I graduated, I had strung together a lot of different fellowships and like one of them began right after graduation. So I highly recommend to all the young journalists out there, it's called Fellowships at Auschwitz for the Study of Professional Ethics. 
and they take you to Berlin. It's the first time I came to Berlin. Krakow, Auschwitz, and Nuremberg, and sort of talk about how journalists, like both German and foreign journalists, covered it at the time. You know, we talk about how come there's only like one or two front page articles in the New York Times about Auschwitz. Like, even once they found out what was going on there, before, sorry, during the war. We talked about, you know, what is your obligation, like balancing sort of access versus like coming out really hard. How do you, what about like, you know, warning people before something's happened if you believe it could happen? All this stuff that at the time felt very distant and historical, right? This is before Trump and, but now is very relevant. So, sorry, I'm digressing. And then anyways, I think I was sort of doing different projects and fellowships and internships until the end of that year. And then finally Guernica agreed to publish it, but they wanted me to cut it down. Shocking. <laughs> and I've struggled with that a bit. And then I got a new job and yeah, it's like I'm preempting your regret question as well because I do think that's my big one one really big regret that I have that I didn't just and like now the people at Columbia are like, why didn't you say? Like we would have helped you, you know? But I'm really bad at asking for help. So anyways so no, it did not get published. And now like it would needs to be updated probably significantly. Not that there've been so many women, but it's just kind of the reporting sold. But, but the main internship I did after I graduated was I got an overseas press club fellowship to intern at Reuters. And they were kind of like, I don't know, it's amazing how many opportunities there are out there and how many of them are really just like, choose your own adventure. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't sort of black, black and white. And they said like, where in the world would you like to go? And I was like, okay, okay, like, I just, you know, I'm, I was always worried somehow about being pigeonholed as a Balkans person. And I was like, oh, you know, Mumbai, Cairo, you know, Johannesburg, like all the exotic places that I still haven't been that I would really like to go. Am I allowed to call them exotic? <laughs> exotic to me. Or just, I don't know, places I would dream to visit as a tourist at least. Um, and they were like, mm, well, like your experiences in the Balkans, so probably you should go there. And I said, okay. And, and in the end, I went to, to Belgrade and I had a really great time there. I hadn't spent very much time there. Like Bosnia was its whole own universe. And so being exposed to Belgrade is kind of the central node, former capital of, of Yugoslavia and sort of connects all the former Yugoslav republics in some ways still or is at the center of them and is the best connected of them. And so I got exposed to, to politics of Serbia and also Kosovo, which was a totally separate universe from Bosnia for me, at least at the time, even though, you know, everyone thinks it's the same region. And actually at the tail end of my time in Belgrade, I had a visit from a friend that I had met in Bosnia who had moved to Kosovo. Now working in Ukraine, there's like a whole parade of... <laughs> war crimes experts that have can remained constant somehow in my life from Bosnia to Kosovo to now to Ukraine. Some of them stopped off in Iraq or elsewhere. But And he kind of said he was up like trying to collect evidence for a case that he was doing in Kosovo. And he was like, come down to Pristina. It's really interesting. It's vibrant. It's different. And I did. I enjoyed it. And I wound up moving there in November 2013 and staying for about four years somehow like which passed in the blink of an eye I was very lucky as well that someone that I had met in Sarajevo I guess who had just reached out knowing that I was an American journalist working in Bosnia was the editor of an English language publication there and it turned out they were looking for a journalist and an English speaker and they hired me almost on the spot to cover the ongoing and still ongoing negotiations between Kosovo and Serbia, which is called, you know, this dialogue for basically trying to determine the future of Serbian Kosovan relations, um, which has unfortunately been going on now for more than 10 years and not succeeding. But in some ways it was very procedural and bureaucratic, but for me it was a very good insight and training into the way that war plunges a country into chaos and how it can take decades to resolve this stuff. You know, basic things like registry of births and deaths, property, you know, marriages, I don't know, license plates and diplomas and all of this type of stuff. I mean, Serbia doesn't recognize Kosovo, which declared independence in 2008. And it is joined by, unfortunately, important Security Council members, Russia and China, who also would not want to see, you know, their 
provinces become former provinces and in independent countries. Yeah. So it was really interesting. And, and Kosovo in Bosnia, the political situation is not great. But in Kosovo, I found it was not great. And it was also incredibly dynamic and different. The population is incredibly young. When I moved there, like 75% of the population is under 35. And it's a beautiful country. It's kind of a plain surrounded by mountains. It was a very nice and beautiful place to live. I met some cool friends. People are very, unlike many other countries you go to, people love Americans and uh, the level of hospitality you've never seen. So everybody wants to befriend you in the street, to talk to you. Kosovars are the only country in Europe, I think, who don't have visa-free travel to the EU. So they really want to travel like through people that they can meet there. Did you work for the same publication the whole time? And uh, I always ask this, does it still exist? It definitely still exists. There was an English language publication that was, it was also part of the Balkan Investigative Reporting Network, actually. But there they also did two TV productions a week and, you know, had a portal also focused on justice, but also general news. It was a really big operation. And the English language arm does still exist it goes through various incarnations. Um, I did, but I also, I, I mean, this whole time, I think I, I was also freelancing, right? So shortly after I started doing that job, the same person, the former editor, Nate Tabak, he had put me in touch with an editor at Foreign Policy who was looking for stuff about Bosnia. I started to freelance for them. And then slowly I started to build up other places that I could fit because my job there was really focused on the dialogue. And I wanted to be able to publish in other places to, you know, more new stuff. And I eventually started working quite a lot for Politico Europe as well. It was great that they had an, an editor there who had also spent time in Serbia and Kosovo, actually as a Reuters correspondent and just returned to Reuters now to be NATO correspondent Andrew Gray. And I felt very lucky to meet in my career editors and journalists who felt very strongly about the Balkans, you know, because of their time there and who felt passionate about the fact that it still deserved coverage because there were people coming in and out and it was really cool because eventually I would meet them, like our mutual friend Kit. But, you know, every week, a few months, and then Kit would send people. But there were almost no journalists based in the region. And at first I was kind of like, oh, this is really, you know, there's not a lot of news. But it was a sweet spot for me where eventually that there wasn't a ton of news, but when there was, like, people knew that I was a person to call to do it, I guess, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> and it eventually, you know, those journalists and editors who did care, you know, did follow that, you know, eventually came across my work and got in touch. And that also helped me a lot in my career. So moral of the story, when someone writes you from out of town asking to have a drink or asking for contacts where you work, like... As long as they're not asking for too many contacts, like it, I always find it useful and beneficial to, to meet them because you never know how it will, what the result of that, of that meeting can be. So when and why do you leave Kosovo then? Well, I really enjoyed it, but what happened was my private life was also intervening. My boyfriend at the time got a job in Vienna capital of the Balkans anyway. <laughs> and in September, 2017, I moved there and I was a little bit at a loss, right? My, like, I had built this whole identity and career of, you know, covering the Balkans. But I also told myself, you know, there were so many times when I would drive, you know, from Pristina to Sarajevo, or once I drove on my birthday from Pristina <laughs> to Srebrenica, which I think takes like 15 hours or 12. Oh, wow. 12. It's all mountain roads. There's not a lot of high. There's basically no highway. And so I said, you know, traveling to any of those places from Vienna is maybe more expensive, but maybe faster. While I was there, I took German classes and Russian classes and continued also to sort of freelance in the Balkans until I realized that a correspondent that I had met, that I had had the luck to meet on like a press trip to Trieste for like an EU Western Balkan summit, was leaving his job in Budapest covering Hungary, Romania, and former Yugoslavia. And I started asking him, like, who's going to replace you? What's going to happen? You know? <laughs> and he said, oh, they have no idea. Actually, you know, you should apply. 
And again, you know, I have never would have found it if I hadn't had the luck to have sat next to him on the bus, you know, in Trieste. I mean, maybe I would, but huh. probably not. Um, and follow him on Twitter and all that stuff. So yeah, I wrote to express my deep and extreme interest in, in the position of the FT. And I was really nervous because, you know, I had never covered Hungary or lived there. My Hungarian <laughs> is <laughs> nothing to write home about. But, you know, I had that solid experience in the majority of the rest of the countries that I would be covering. And I was lucky that the editors there gave me a chance after a long interview process and a lot of tests. <laughs> so I moved to Hungary and I lived this kind of Ka und Ka, Kaiserin König, um, Budapest, Vienna existence, living in the seventh district of both cities and covering and really learning and exploring Hungary as well, which was a very different animal, but which is also now increasingly becoming an actor in the Balkans. Cool. So working at the FT. Okay. Yeah. Like, I mean, you'd been a freelancer for a long time. I mean, how did you find things there? Was it nice having the stability? Was it weird? Was it weird having to care about kind of financial topics all of a sudden as well as general news? Uh, how, how did you find it? Well, I mean, I was terrified. I had not covered business. And I mean, I know that money makes the world go round and I was super interested in it. But, you know, I had like college econ. And I was also very nervous about just the difference in communication style between British and American people. Sure. <laughs> like I had a, another good friend who was working for The Guardian in Budapest. And sometimes I would send him my, letter, my editor's messages like, is this good or does he absolutely hate it? And I just don't know. You know, so I was like trying to read the, the communication style. No, I, I was nervous, but I'm really glad about that because it propelled me to, I was so lucky I had the luxury of getting the FT delivered to me every day and I just read it every day, you know, as much as I could. And I was also just super honest with people that I was meeting in a way that I think mostly worked, you know, I just said like, look, this is my background. I've been in the Balkans. I'm new in Hungary. And also like, I'm not an expert on, I'm trying to think of something, you know, car parts. Like what Hungary is, is a massive part of German car industry. And there are also, you know, all sorts of companies that are supplying parts and, and things related to that. And so you, I would just go and, you know, level with people. And in general, as long as people could see that I had done some research, I found that people were patient and understanding. And, and if you approach them in the right way, they like to talk about what they do and what they're interested in and what they spend their whole lives working towards. So I learned a lot doing that. And it's, it stood me in good stead, I think, I hope. But it was, of course, very intimidating, you know, because there are certainly parts of the FT that I didn't understand when I started working there, <laughs> certain specific columns, right? But also, you know, I was not working in a heavily financial, most of the countries that I was covering didn't have their own stock markets or, you know. But this, it was also a different time for Hungary, right? Like, Orban had been in power for, for 10 years. It was very difficult to get meetings with anybody high up in the government because the way that the government treated the country's financial institutions and, and biggest companies, you know, was being well documented in our pages. And, and instead, you know, the FT is also considers itself, you know, the paper of record in Brussels. And I wound up writing much more about Orban's style in trying to extract concessions from the EU or working as a spoiler in Brussels than necessarily the business, you know, and there's all of that is connected, of course, to corruption, EU funds, money, but it's also a very political story. And, you know, that was really important to sort of show how he's gotten his talons into sort of every segment of society to really lay the groundwork for a system in which even if he loses an election, he'll be back and those who support him would be back very quickly. Before we get into the times, I was just going to ask out of curiosity if you ever did one of those lunch with the FTs that people love so much. Oh my God, I did. And I loved it. It's actually one of my favorite things as well. I had lunch with Erno Rubik, the creator of the Rubik's Cube, who is a Hungarian oh, wow. who continues to live in Hungary. And he wrote a memoir. And so for the occasion of his memoir, I got to sit down with him and 
have lunch and talk to him. And it was kind of also, again, like, of my depth. I have never been able to finish the Rubik's Cube. And there was like a kid at the next table who <laughs> had learned, I don't know, during the lockdown, during the pandemic, he had just learned it. And so, but it was cool. Like he is a celebrity there. Like everyone wanted to have a photo with him at the restaurant. Oh, that's and funny. He was very, yeah, I, I, I tried to draw him on more political stuff. But that was really difficult. And like the book is partially written from the cube's perspective, I think. And <laughs> you know, this anthropomorphized the cube. And, and I do think that he is probably 100% convinced that the cube is bigger than Hungary and Orban and all of that. So, <laughs> yeah. That's but funny. he was very kind. And you just love to meet these kind of mathematicians with twinkle in their eye, you know? Yeah, that's cool. That's very cool. I had no idea that guy was still alive and around. Oh, my God. But one problem, one thing that was difficult about this interview was that the lunch was not good. Like, he picked the place. <laughs> he didn't want to have a lot of courses. And he ordered, I think, like, I don't know. And he kept saying, you know, my wife's cooking is better and this and that. And, like, the editors kept saying, okay, all of the stuff that you've written about him and the background is great and, you know, the questions. But, like, we need more about the food. And I'm like, the food is nothing to write home about. I just can't. This our, our, That was the hardest part of the lunch. Just, like, trying to say something that wasn't really negative about the you can't because you just don't want to like pan that anyways yeah it that's i mean part of the reason people love these interviews is because it's all the stuff you know you know i'll go to a meeting and note down like all the little details and it will just like go sit in a notebook for the rest of my life and i'll never use them but the <laughs> lunch in the ft like mentions all these tiny details about what the person's wearing what you're eating like how they said what they said stuff like that which people love but that's funny okay yeah so then how how do you end up at the times i feel like when i first wrote to you you had just moved there or something like that so around when did it happen and how did it all go down oh my goodness it, it was a long and drawn out transition and knowing what i know now i wish that it had happened sooner and i ft was great because I actually had a lot of freedom. It's not that every day there was something on my patch. And I was not on a full-timer. I was I still had a stringer, I think, mostly because they have a really hard time establishing business operations in Hungary, whatever. So I really was free to go to whatever conference I want. And they were always really hungry for... In the Balkans, you have really easy access to politicians. And so I guess I would travel a lot to meet prime minister or president of, of respective countries. But I was at a conference, I think, and I started to meet some colleagues from the New York Times, future colleagues. And at a certain point, I I think that I had actually gotten in touch the first time when I heard that there was a vacancy, I think twice. <laughs> I think that I knew, you know, I always had my eye on Eastern Europe job, which is based in Warsaw, but it's like 17 countries, you know, from the Balkans to the Baltics, basically. And I never, I don't know that I would have necessarily put my hat in the ring for a Russia job, having not covered it and knowing how huge the Moscow press corps is. So once I wrote kind of early on saying, I love my job at the FT, I'm not looking to leave, but like the only job that I would ever leave for would be this one, if you would consider me, you know, and they sort of said, oh, we've, you know, normally like hire from within our staff, but you know, thanks for being in touch. And then right before I joined the FT, actually beginning of 2018, I had been a fixer translator for two different Times journalists in Bosnia and in Kosovo for like three, four stories, I think. And I was like driving, fixing. And I'm really glad I had that experience where I try also to always put myself in the shoes of the fixer translator now. And it was like so nerve wracking and stressful, you know, your first experience, <laughs> like fixing for a journalist that you've been reading for such a long time and all that. And one of the journalists that I had been fixing for who had been in Poland and covered, you know, Kosovo and Bosnia I knew that that person was leaving to London and I had heard from others that they didn't know who would replace him. So I wrote again. It, I racked up the courage to write again. And I think by the time I wrote, it was a bit late, but I got a response from the foreign editor at the time saying, well, that job's been filled, but do you speak Russian? Actually, at first I just got like, thanks, that job's been filled. Like, nice to be in touch. Like, goodbye. <laughs> and then I, and I was like, oh man, you know, what I... But then... Not that long afterwards, he wrote back, like, actually, do you speak Russian? We'll have a job opening there soon. And I was kind of like, really? Really? 
I do, you know, but it's not perfect, but you know, it's there. And then I was like following the site and I saw that the vacancy posted and I was like, oh my God, what do I do? And I had happened to see another New York Times journalist, like right when it, the vacancy was open and they were like, you need to write to the foreign editor for a call. And I'm like, why do they want to talk to me? And what do I say? You know, it just, but you know, and they were like, well, they'll see it as a sign of confidence and bravery and whatever. And I'm not that I'm, you know, I'm the person who didn't go to office hours because I'm like nervous of like wasting my professor's time. (laughs) So, so I did that though and had a terrible call. It was like one of those things where it's like the guy's like, I don't know how much I should say about it because it's, I mean, he still works with it. I mean, it was also me. He was kind of like, okay, what do you want to know? And I was like, well, how do I make my application stand out? You know, I wanted to tell you a bit about myself. And he was like, this is not a job interview. Like you have to apply and like blah. And it was just like, okay. So, and I had heard that the, the, the editors of the New York times don't love the FT writing style. And I was just like, okay, like, look, I just, I need to, to know how to prove to you that I'm not just like a hack from the FT. As someone who, like, still has an FT subscription, loves the FT, enjoys the writing style, I was just trying to, you know, be memorable. I don't know. So when he said, well, we do hire people from the outside, you know, Hannah Beach, one of our best journalists, came to us after 20 years of time, you know. But it was a really short call. It was one that kept getting postponed. Like, it was supposed to be, you know, one time, and then it just kept, and finally I was like, okay, can we have this call? And so I'm sure it was just so annoying. You know, the last thing someone wants to do on their weekend is, like, talk to a person. And I had spent all day trying to prepare for it, right? Anyway, so I just, in the end, he was just like, you know, you just have to apply. So I did. I, I like, made a new website, updated my resume, wrote a cover letter, even though that was not asked. But I think it's kind of important because otherwise, how do they know who you are or distinguish you? It contained a lot of what I already told you about, like, my personal interest for the region and for this job. And then I think I had like six job interviews. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So yeah, it took a long time. And then getting the visa took a long time. So I think this was already in December 2020, these initial discussions. And then I was told maybe in February, the FT had heard that I was talking to the New York Times. So they sent me a much improved contract and put a three month uh, notice period. <laughs> so then I had to do the three month notice period. Uh, Michael Slackman, the foreign editor, was like, "There's no way they were going to ask you to do that." And I said that to my editor at the FT, who I really love and I'm still have a good relationship with. He was like, "Oh, we definitely want you to do that." <laughs> so it just took a really long. And you know, had I known I would get the job, I wouldn't have signed the new and improved contract. But it was like significantly improved. So. And, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe I shouldn't air the FT story launch, but I didn't have health insurance until that new contract. Oh, wow. And it was a global pandemic, right? So got to get that health insurance. So they were trying to scout lots of candidates to replace me. And all the women I talked to were who were like, I don't know about that. <laughs> yeah, so I got the job and then I had to wait for the visa. And I was not expecting my internship with Bill Burns to to help me with a background check and all that. So in the end, it was August 31st, 2021, when I finally landed in Moscow. Okay, wow. And I'm sad for the Bureau having to, like, wait for such a long time. Yeah, and then, you know, six months later, the war started. (laughs) Right, yeah, yeah, and the job must have changed considerably, and... I mean, what has happened in the interim? Like, what has happened in this short amount of time you've worked for the Times? So, well, a lot. (laughs) The biggest land war in Europe. No, but actually that January was, I don't know how many of the listeners would remember, but in January, Kazakhstan exploded in uh, this paroxysm of violence. And I remember watching it. I was on the train coming back from St. Petersburg on January 4th. And I remember seeing on Twitter, like, oh, my goodness, something is popping off. People are protesting in this autocracy where nobody protests. And then the protest grew and grew. And I remember writing to my editor saying, hey, like, maybe I should go there. Like, this is big. And then they closed the border for a while. And, you know, one of my colleagues, Yvonne, had tried to go over land, but then got COVID at the hotel or something in Kyrgyzstan. And then I had been told by other friends that 
Before, I think there was like visa-free travel for, you know, citizens of the UK and America and all this stuff. And then a British friend of mine was told like, oh, the COVID restrictions were lifted, you know, the beginning of January. So you can actually go visa-free if there's a flight from your country. So finally, I think January 11th or something, after all of this stuff had happened and the streets had been sort of cleaned up, I finally was able to get on a plane, but I was held because there was not visa-free travel for Americans unless uh. you had like a significant reason, like a relative or for whatever reason, the rule was if there's a direct flight from that country. And I was not, I was flying from Russia, but I was lucky from the Moscow days to have actually known someone, the acting and that the ambassador. Am I allowed to say this? I'm a, anyways, <laughs> she, she had been an economic officer in Moscow and I was in touch with her and she contacted the authorities and I was able to get out into Astana, which was then still called Nur Sultan after the president and do my reporting. I promptly came back and contracted COVID like the rest of our bureau in Moscow and Ukraine that had all had COVID at the same time at the beginning of February. But with this Kazakhstan memory fresh in my mind, I kept insisting to my editors to go to Ukraine from the beginning of February, just knowing that they, they could close the borders, that it's going to be difficult to get in, that it's sure. going to be, you know, who knows what's going to happen. That being said, it's not that I expected what happened to happen. I, and they said, 10 days and you're coming back because the bureau chief's going to be alone and there's too much news from Russia. And, you know, you go in there. I had pitched a, an economic story that even though there was no war yet, you know, Ukraine's economy was already being battered. And they said, after you finish the story, you're going back. And I said, well, let's see about that. You know, the signs are not good. And so, you know, I had the hiking boots, but I also had like, I don't know, the nice tops for going out in the cool clubs of Kiev because maybe we were all overdoing it. And, and the atmosphere <laughs> among my Russian friends was one of like such tremendous denial. There was such frustration at the American media and at Biden for overblowing this, you know, because of course, like, it's an absolutely insane thing to do that is not in Russia's interest. So I don't want to say I totally believed that, but I just thought maybe you're overdoing it. Anyways, fast forward 10 days later. So I flew there on Valentine's Day. Ukraine is my Valentine. And <laughs> I did my economic story. There was a bunch of cyber attacks. And then on the 19th, I went to the East on a press tour. We flew to Krematorsk. We then went to a base in Bakhmut. And then we went to what was then the front line. It's Philodarsk. And, you know, we were talking to soldiers. And at that time, already for two days, there had been sort of incessant fire along the front line. And I think photographers and, and the video team wanted to see where the shelling had been that morning. And actually, just as we were leaving there, we also, like our small group of journalists, got shelled too. And then eventually, you know, this was my first time in such a situation. And then eventually... The shelling started quite, it became quite intense, so we pulled off and sheltered in the local sort of army headquarters before going back to Krematorsk for, for a big press conference. I had this, like, vest from Moscow, I think it was, like, from the Chechen Wars, you know, this really, like, big helmet. Our bureau, before I joined, was all men, and I don't know how I even made this stuff fit me, but but I was, yeah, trying to figure out what is the story, like, okay, there's shooting going on, this is the place, but... I did have like quite a lot of adrenaline. And in the end, we made it into a little bit more of like a first person piece. And then I came back and a few days later, on the 23rd, I think I had already been assigned to write a profile of Zelensky. We were having all these other discussions, you know, like they had postponed the, the planning meetings for the year until this time. So we, I was on a call about like, how are we going to cover the populists in Europe? You know, we postponed the Russia-Ukraine call because we had too much work. And then on the 23rd, around 9 p.m., I got a message from one of my colleagues who has good sources in Ukrainian intelligence saying like, it's all happening tomorrow morning. Like maximalist scenario, Kiev, Dnipro, D Donbass, Lviv, it's starting. And I think I was reading this message and I like stripped over two flights of stairs because it was so shocking. <laughs> I was actually meeting friends from the FT, The Economist, and 
AP for dinner. And I told them all this. They didn't have that information. I bumped into Remy Ordan on my way to the dinner. I don't know if you know, he's like veteran war correspondent for Le Monde. He like, covered the whole siege of Sarajevo and many, many other wars, spent a lot of time in Syria. And um, this old wise guy. And I sort of told him, like, it's all popping off tomorrow. We just got it. You know, and I was, of course, like, my adrenaline was again up. And he just sort of like patted me on the head like that sweet, you know, if you need, you know, if you need anything like this is come to, you know, I'm staying at the Radisson, come for a drink or whatever. So I told all my friends and we sort of gathered in my hotel room because the New York Times has a very large, shall we say, like security team, right? We had a someone managing it. Each group of journalists moving around has someone, you know, and it's not only someone who they're normally ex-military, they know first aid, they know battlefield medicine, and they just know, you know, they can make a escape route or whatever. And most of my colleagues didn't have anything like that. So it's just said like, you know, come and talk to my guy and he'll like tell us, you know, pack, you know, pack your bag, have your sat phone, have everything ready. And then I guess like we stayed in my room and drank wine for a while. And then eventually everyone went home. I think I stayed, I, I stayed up till... I don't know, 4.45, because I think that the original time listed was, you know, 4 in the morning or 4.45. I couldn't sleep. And then I finally did, and I think that the third missile woke me up in Kiev. Yeah, and then it had all started. Wow. So how long you ended up staying a lot longer, I'm guessing? Um, yes. Well, we, I stayed until, I think, like March 2nd or 3rd, they made a decision. Because at that time, it looked... There are different, you know, in hindsight now, you talk to other people who, like I talked to a Reuters photographer who said, well, our security guy said, there's no way the Russians can have the enough troops or capability to actually surround and take Kiev. But there are others who thought it was really likely impossible. So I didn't want to leave, but London and New York made a decision to evacuate everybody except for one journalist, one photographer, and the leader of the security team. So Sabrina Tavernese from The Daily and I, you know, we stayed for a week and then we joined the caravan of people heading west. It's normally a five hour drive or something from Kiev and it was, it took us three days and, but it was really interesting because we met all these people along the way and I wrote a piece about the exodus of people and Sabrina did an episode about it and you know, we were meeting a lot of people on the road from various parts of Ukraine, from Odessa. We met a lot of people from Kharkiv, and all of them were saying to us, you know, we have relatives on the other side of the border. We've been calling them. We were sitting under shelling. We told them what was going on, and they don't believe us. And I had been watching Russian propaganda from Moscow as part of my job, especially in the lead-up to the war, trying to figure it out. But for me, it was so shocking that there were so many people for whom, I don't know, this propaganda was more believable than their own family, you know, who was calling them from under the shelling. And I wrote a story about that. And just to give a, an example of how pervasive it was, like, there was such a huge problem with hotels in Lviv. And so we were constantly moving around. Sabrina and I were sharing a room <laughs> at, at one point. And <laughs> once we finally, yeah, it was cool. I actually was, I was still stunned, like, for the, for the first period because you know you hear someone's voice on the radio and you know that voice and then that voice is actually right next to you but she's so it was really cool to spend that time with her and to get to know her and to watch her rolling down the window talking to people out of their cars and so I'm trying to finish my file this story about Russian family members who don't believe in what's really happening and I told this to the hotel attendant who was coming up to see like when I was going to get out of my room and she was like oh my god like same story with my dad you know who's in Russia I mean her parents were divorced so I just thought like everywhere you push you could see this tremendous denial but also tremendous connection right I mean at least 11 million families have relatives on both sides and it's huge number of people and it's really devastating and and at a certain point I started to realize that all of my experience in the Balkans you know, in the former Yugoslavia, where people with a shared language, for the most part, besides Kosovo, and uh, and culture, and movies, and history in one country, like, how all of that could fall apart so fast. And obviously, it's different with Ukraine, but there are many more similarities than, than I expected, I think. And I think it became, like, that exodus and that time in Lviv as well, and I stayed another 
a month and a half or something in Western Ukraine, sort of covering that region and also covering occupied territories like Mariupol. That was really hard in a different way. I think it's really, it's, I don't know, I felt in Kiev, didn't know what was going to happen, if they're going to take the city or if, you know, I'm going to worry about my personal security. But to go to Lviv and just see tens of thousands of people pouring into the train station every day with like a tiny backpack and maybe a dog and children, mothers with children who were, you know, had no idea where they should go or what they should do. That was so devastating and painful. And it's really embarrassing because people would talk to you and you don't, I had to keep myself from, from crying because it's like, I don't, these people are, everybody was so strong and so tough and they were, you know, doing what they needed to do. And the last thing they need is like <laughs> journalist <laughs> feeling bad for them, you know? Sure. So, yeah. And then the rest of March was really Mariupol. But we don't have to go month by month. <laughs> so you tell me where you, we should. I mean, you were covering it out of Lviv? Mm-hmm. I really tried to insist on going to Dnipro or Zaporizhia. But I think that at that time, you know, we had to start this operation more or less from scratch. Like, I think there had been one rental car and then we had like a driver. But I think there wasn't enough security personnel. So I was doing it from Lviv. Yeah. And that's also like in its own way, really weird. Like you're sitting in the hotel room just calling people every day who are living through horror or who have lost touch with their families. And I was alone as well. And that was kind of really lonely and like every day sad. Yeah. Well, did they finally decide? I mean, like Reuters, we rotated people in and out every month just for safety and people's sanity and things like that. Was that ultimately why you left? Uh, like it was just time for a break. Yeah. Yes. So I left for a month. Well, like, you know, my whole life also exploded in the meantime, right? Like, I had just moved to Moscow. All of my friends were there. Partner, no idea if I'm going back there or what to do. And I hadn't, I think, had any leave really since I had started with the paper. So I had a few weeks off. And then I went back again in May, at the beginning of May. And this time, you know, I went back to Kiev. And the situation was amazing. You know, there was still this positive energy coming from, you know, having pushed the Russians out of Bucha and out of all the territories around Kiev that were occupied. People were ignoring the air alarm. It was spring. And people were, of course, dying every day. And, and every day my colleagues were going to funerals and every day they were finding mass graves. But there was also this really positive energy in the air. This similar to, I think, the positive energy, you know, that came after the Kharkiv counteroffensive or the retaking here so on, you know, but now of course the situation is way different. Oh, also, you know, there was like, because in the early days there were soldiers everywhere, you know, you couldn't walk in the streets without people with guns checking you. Everybody was jumpy, right? Even in Lviv in the first months, like everybody was wary of Russian spies or, you know, there was all of these people coming from the East to Lviv and, staying with relatives or renting property and like people would report them to the police. I did a story about that as well. Just everybody was paranoid about anyone who had a phone, partially because there were people who were informing, right? Who were giving coordinates of airfields or other strategic targets. And there was this real paranoia in there. And a lot of that had sort of passed by the time I went back to Kiev. Yeah. So between then and now, it sounds like you're probably not going to be going back to Ukraine. You've decided, have you decided you there's more to be done reporting on the Russian side? Well, it's not totally my decision. I would love and I really hope that I will go back to Ukraine at some point this year. I think that this is not a discussion that I've fully had with anyone really who can decide these things. But at this point, the situation is such that I am the only uh, the only person from, from the New York Times who has a Russian visa that is not a Russian citizen. And my colleagues are also all men, right? So they don't know if whether it's a situation of like, you know, being penalized because of the censorship laws or getting conscripted. So it's been deemed only safe for, for me to go back. And, and nobody knew, right? There was a, a big apprehension because of the fact that I had spent so much time in Ukraine and, and written about Russian war crimes there. And I really sort of insisted on going back before my visa expired because I felt like, if I don't try, 
one of the biggest and most influential newspapers will have no one in the biggest country in the world like with whom we are engaged in a massive war. And Putin, you know, will have not had to do anything or the Kremlin or whoever is in power, right? It will just be us. So I felt like we have to try. And that's where we're at. And so I think that there's a belief that if my time is finite and I'm the only one that can go there, I think that, that I'm sure they would be very happy if there were other journalists who had visas, right? But it's only me right now. Whereas we have a lot of incredibly talented journalists doing great stuff in Ukraine, so. Right, and I mean, how Russians view the war as it goes on and on, and Putin finally has to call it a war, and like, you know, it becomes <laughs> harder to deny what's going on. It, it's a pretty interesting story to tell from the Russian side. For me, it was really important, I think, to, and it was really shocking as well, to experience the level of apathy, right? I mean, I'd been at sites of missile strikes. I went to the Kremenchuk Mall when it was hit. Like, I've spoken to people who are either totally in denial about that happening or totally apathetic about it. Or were still, like, enthusiastic about <laughs> it, right? So this is a really a difficult... I'm still trying to figure out, you know, to how to interact with people. And I think that... I remember reading Josh Yaffa had a, had a great piece in The New Yorker about how the Americans have increasingly armed Ukraine and what, how they decided to do that. And there was a line in there about the White House's thinking, you know, that obviously they didn't want to be drawn into it, but that there was also this conviction that as soon as the coffin started coming home and a general draft started, people would start to turn against the war. And, and that would eventually bring about some change. And the last story I did before leaving Russia, before the holidays, I went to Ryazan in like a city with a pretty elite paratrooper unit and it was a hub a training hub as well for a lot of soldiers and I went to the cemetery and you know met a mother there of a soldier who had died actually in the first days of the invasion and I try in different ways to ask people you know whose fault this is or do you feel that they died for a cause that you and they didn't believe in and and in Rizan, the answer that I was always hearing is something had to be done. Nobody explains about exactly about who, or exactly <laughs> about why, you know. And the woman at the cemetery was, you know, explained how her son had called her on February 23rd, the night before the war started, saying he was in Belarus. And he thought that something could happen and possibly he wouldn't come home. And the mom sort of said, yeah, well, it's so strange because, you know, we went there every summer and I, I knew that would be over. And then I said to her, like, you know, do you, I don't know that I, it's really hard to ask someone, like, do you think he died for no reason or something? But I asked her, you know, who's responsible for this? Is it the Kremlin? Is it the West? And she said something had to be done. And it was the same refrain from a mother who had protested her own son's mobilization after September but not because the war is misguided or wrong, but because, you know, she needs him for help with her other disabled son, and she needs him for help around the house. She has no husband, and she was just asking that, that it be delayed, you know? And she said she felt really proud when she sees him in uniform, even standing in front of a car that had Ukrainian license plates, so who knows how he got control of that car. And it was weird, because she really was frustrated with the system and the way that, you know, her son was the one picked out, but the wider situation did not. And she said that she wanted, like, you know, Biden to die or something, but I didn't hear any expression whatsoever of any sadness or pain for innocent Ukrainians who are caught up in this, nothing. Just the empathy not there. There's certainly part of it that it's not shown in the same way, you know, and she did say that she watches TV, like state, TV, you know, political TV all the time. But I think it's a different sort of variety of difficulty to talk to these people who don't seem to mind the death and destruction occurring. Yeah, that's tough. And it's also set, you know, you also see that change is not coming anytime soon and the, the predictions, I mean, and it's similar to, you know, the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, which changed the country in many, many ways. But the anger and frustration and opposition, it took some years for that to build. Well, let's talk about a couple of stories. The next question is, uh, take a story you're proud of from any time in your career and just tell us a, a bit about it and the story behind the story, how you got the idea, how you reported it out, publication, any reaction, just, yeah, 
um, give us some insight into how you do your work? I think the thing that I'm proud of, and I'll talk about it less because if people, if anyone's interested, they can go and listen to it if they haven't already, is a piece that I did with Sabrina on The Daily about two conversations I had at the Russian draft office and what it says about Russian attitudes to the war. I went uh, one October day to, while the mobilization campaign was still in full swing in, in Moscow, to a draft office and watched as three different groups of Russian men were being shipped off for training, basically. And I talked to one guy who was drafted that morning at his hostel. <laughs> he was a handyman who had come from more than a thousand miles away to work in the capital and had the draft officers like show up when he and his brother were coming out of the shower and say, like, you're coming with us. When like several hours later, he was going off to war without even being able to go back to pick up his belongings at his hostel. And then I spoke to the wife of another guy who was being mobilized about what it was like to be left behind and how they had sort of ignored the war basically since it had started, more or less until he got his draft card, his summons. Yeah, and that was published fairly recently, I think in December. So I had done that reporting for a story I did about like the the way that we talked about internally was Moscow without men. So how Moscow felt while the draft was going on. And actually, you know, it was only, I don't know, two, three paragraphs of that story. But I f really find the podcast format to give you so much more space and time to be able to explore how people really feel And of course, it's always more powerful when you can hear people's voices. So I was really grateful that Sabrina was so interested in the, in the topic and, and gave that space to sort of talk about it. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, the question that immediately comes to mind for that is, why did the Russians let you get in within a mile of a draft office? Like, I don't know, uh, maybe I'm just used to China where it's like if they don't want you to report on something, they will make your life difficult and make it impossible to report. The Russians don't. I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I, I, I hope, I, you know, because there were plenty of officials around. There were police and military people, bureaucrats. But I went there with the photographer, Nana Heitman, whose work is incredible. If you don't know her, follow her on Instagram. And, you know, we just went there. I was using my phone and just dressed up as a normal person. And, and she, too. And we just sort of hung around for a while. I already told you how shy I am when it comes to Vox Pop. So for like an hour, I didn't talk to anyone. Eventually, I felt so weird. We went to a nearby cafe. We had a coffee and a lunch. And we, and we came back and eventually, I guess, felt, you know, once you've been somewhere for a while, I don't know, you can start to interact with people. Like there was a mom and a soldier and she kept making photos of him. And I was like, oh, you know, do you want some photos together? And you sort of slowly try to talk to people. And I guess, you know, because I was using my phone, nobody noticed. But, you know, Nana, she has a camera and she was taking pictures and somehow nobody asked us, you know, why are you here? What are you doing? Because <laughs> I know that other people then found out where we went and heard about our experience and tried to go and, and were escorted off the premises and stuff. So we just got lucky. And I think two young women, nobody's like freaked out or anything. I don't know. Huh, yeah, maybe the authorities just hadn't thought of it yet. And once they see it published once, they're like, oh, we need to watch out for that now. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, there are, still, there are still ways around. Yeah, it depends. You know, if you travel, like if you book a train ticket, they can track you. So I've definitely had my own run-ins with surveillance in different parts of Russia. But somehow with this, nobody stopped us. Cool. So then next up is the lightning round, which is faster paced questions. Do you feel ready for that? I think so. The first question is about a must read publication about your region. And for this, I'm looking for something that is a little more local, maybe something basically that people haven't heard of. I'm not looking for an international publication that if you're interested in, say, Russia, Eastern Europe, the Balkans, whatever, that uh, you think they deserve credit and deserve a shout out uh, that it's worth following? Oh, well, I'm a big advocate of reading Russian media. So I think the publications that I would reference off the top of my head are, are Novaya Gazeta, which won the Nobel Prize, whose founder 
I won the Nobel Prize and shared it with Maria Ressa in 2021. Not only are they still functioning on some level inside of the country, despite a lot of problems, they have a pretty good English language website, and they've also established a presence in Europe. And the other place that I think is really great is a new or longer form uh, publication called Cholod, which means cold. And I've read a couple of long treatments of uh, stories that I find really interesting, like they did one story that really examined in close detail the career of Ilya Yashin, who is an opposition politician that just got sentenced to 11 years in prison, I hope it's 11 years, with an extra like four years ban from social media or the internet after that. And he's just been moved to the Udmurta Republic to serve his sentence. And his only crime, of course, was talking about Bucha and citing the BBC. So he was put away for like spreading fakes about Russia's quote-unquote special military operation. And then what is a publication, at least vaguely journalistic in nature, that you read, listen to, or watch for fun? So it can be any format. Oh my God, does everyone say John Oliver? (laughs) No, actually not that many people. I find that like he's doing pretty serious journalism some of the time. And it's also funny. And then more specifically, what is the best journalistic article piece, again, whatever medium that you've consumed recently, and it can't be from your own publication? Josh Yaffa from The New Yorker, he did a piece, I think a lot of journalists were trying, I wrote a piece about uh, sexual violence in the war in Ukraine, and I did speak to one survivor, but I think it's a really difficult topic right now, especially given the way Ukraine is, given the fact that many of the survivors are outside of Ukraine, and given the stigma and the fact that very few people want to talk, there's a lot more to say about the, you know, the ombudsman who was like raising awareness was fired for people thought exaggerating the problem. And so I really liked what Josh did, which was just speaking to psychologists who were helping these women without re-traumatizing them or re-exposing any of them. He spoke to psychologists, and his piece was a real punch in the gut. I thought he did it really well, and I was glad that he highlighted that. That was already, like, many months ago. Recent is relative. I mean, it's more about a piece that stuck with you that, you know, you find yourself thinking about later. If you had to trade places with one journalist living or dead, and you would have their career, who would it be? I have been reading a lot of books lately, especially, well, since since I started going back to Russia, I've been reading a lot of books about how journalists, sorry, foreign correspondents operated in Russia during communism, and also how foreign correspondents covered the rise of fascism in Germany, and I think I would be very interested to live a day or a month or a week or a lifetime in in the shoes of um, Sigrid Schultz. I don't know if you've heard of her. She is believed, I think, to be the first female bureau chief of an American publication. She was uh, an American who grew up first in America, then France and Berlin, and covered the rise of Hitler and the rise of fascism, interviewed Hitler, and was one of the first people to sort of warn the world about what was coming and about why Hitler's message was catching on with people and why he could take power and stayed in Germany for much of that time. I think in 41, she got typhus, and she was also, like, blocked from embedding with troops because she was a woman. I need to read a little bit more. I would like to read some of her memoirs or something because she, from the early days, started to cultivate relationships with members of the Nazi elites, which is, I guess, how she was also able to understand so well and, and worry so much about what was happening, and she maintained those ties. I mean, sometimes she published under a pseudonym. But I think a lot about, and I'm trying to read a lot about that period now as I think about what stories I want to work on in Russia. Because you see a lot of similarities. And I'm not the only one. Like, most of my Russian friends, and and actually, like, it's bestsellers. You know, if you go to a bookstore in Moscow, it's Germany and the Rise of Fascism that's bestsellers. It's 1984. It's, you know, other dystopian uh, wow. literature by Russians. That That's really what's selling out. Yeah. Oh, wow. I had no idea. What is one thing that most people don't know about you? Whenever we had to play all these stupid, like, get-to-know-you games in high school and college and all these icebreakers and stuff, I would always say, like, I never ordered a pizza or rented a movie. Now, like, since COVID, COVID was the first time that I ever 
ordered food to my house. Um, but now it's like, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like growing up, we never, I never did that. So, but like, I don't know that that's anything anybody needs to know about me <laughs> or wants to know. But, but I mean, there's uh, like, there's a lot beyond the growing up part of your life between then and COVID happening. <laughs> that uh, You could have ordered a pizza. Never did it. Weird. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Interesting. <laughs> I think at a certain point I became opposed to it. I would just cook something and go out. It's not like, I don't know that it's like a badge of honor, but it's, it's true. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, let's see. What is your favorite film, book, TV, or other piece of media about journalists and why? I think I mentioned that I've been on this kick lately of trying to read about journalists from the 30s. So now I'm listening. I don't know, actually, if it's my favorite yet. I'm listening to a book called Last Call at the Hotel Imperial, which is about, you know, a whole generation of American correspondents who sort of moved to Europe in the 20s and 30s and witnessed the rise of fascism you know, chronicled uh, Europe between the wars, I guess. And there's really a lot of detail and a lot of tangents, but as someone who goes on a lot of tangents myself, I guess I'm sympathetic to that. <laughs> it's a audiobook or a podcast or? Oh, well, the last time I went home, I finally went down to my local library and got myself a library card. So with that, you can get a Libby subscription and you can listen to what to any audiobook you want. And I've been doing that since November, which was the last time I was home, and, and, and really enjoying it, finally, yeah. Oh, nice. So I'm listening to it. Okay. And then the final question is, qualifications aside, if you couldn't be a journalist, what job would you do? Would I go to space? Would I be an animal conservationist? Would I try to, I don't know, do something like Samantha Power? Would I, I don't know, because I really never imagined any other life. Like, sure. I honestly do feel like I'm living my dream. I mean, my dream doesn't involve Russia invading Ukraine, but in general, if that's happening, you know, being able to cover it for the publication that I do cover it, I just never wanted anything besides that. But maybe I would go to space. Sure. Yeah. That's a good one. <laughs> I think I did always sort of have this weird dream about being the drummer in a rock band, like whether it's an all girl rock band or like an all male rock band. And I'm like the female drummer who occasionally sings sometimes. <laughs> I, I can't play the drums. <laughs> That's a good answer though. But I always thought that would be cool. Yeah. That's cool. I'll just wrap up the recorded part of the interview by saying thanks so much for coming on the podcast, Valerie. That's our show. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Valerie Hopkins, Moscow correspondent for the New York Times. I'll post links to some of the things Valerie talked about in the podcast description and also on our show page, foreignpod.podbean.com. If you like this episode of Foreign Correspondents, please subscribe to the show in Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts and give it a rating. Beyond that, it would be a huge help if you also write out a review saying what you think about the show. It helps get the podcast more attention. Follow or tweet at me on Twitter at at foreignpod. On Facebook, our page is facebook.com slash foreignpod. Above all, if you know someone who might like the podcast, please recommend it to them. The show is produced and edited by me. Our music is a track called Love Chances by Mackay Beats. There's more information on that in the podcast description and on our show page. Please look for the next episode in February. Until then, I'm Jake Spring. And this is Born Correspondence.